The last week was a great experience. A temperature of 38.5 for I don't know how many days, fatigue and no social networks. Total isolation, almost mystical I would say. However, it was in that moment of febrile delirium that I asked myself, I wonder if there are peoples in the world as isolated as the sick Simone locked up in his bedroom. Well, they exist. They are also many. It's hard to know how many uncontacted tribes exist today. According to the research group Survival International, that number would be more than 100 worldwide. The names of those known tribes are exotic and often unpronounceable. Awa, Mascopiro, Kawahiva, Ayoreo, Yanomami, Toromona, Korubu, Tagaeri, Korowai, Asmat. Just to mention a dozen of them. A tribe can be said to be uncontacted when four factors exist. Self-sufficiency in food, typical of hunter-gatherer people, geographic remoteness, poor technological level, equal to that of peoples who never went through the Bronze or Iron Age, and finally reduced immunity to diseases. Translated, a cold of ours can kill them. Now, some of you may remember the US missionary John Allen Chow who was killed in 2018 by the indigenous people of the creepy Sentinel Island, off the Andaman Islands in India. Here John, in his mission of religious conversion, made a grave mistake of underestimation, perhaps a legacy of the myth of the good savage. One must first understand that defining these tribes as uncontacted can be misleading. It's impossible to avoid contact with outsiders altogether. Even just an unwanted sighting can undo their total isolation. Sure, tenacity in refusing even violently contact with the quote-unquote outside world is an aspect that unites these tribes. It may also be that some of them have had dealings with outsiders in the past, and that because of the violence of the settlers, they have decided to keep away from, shall we say, civilized men. Let us say civilized but we shall see that we may not be so civilized as people. It may also be that other tribes have never had any interest in being approached, but undoubtedly the factor that plays into the isolation of all these tribes is geography. These peoples live in remote and hardly explorable corners of the planet. The Amazon, the forests of New Guinea, Congo or islands scattered in the ocean, all places where even Livingstone would have given up venturing. In the case of New Guinea, the region of West Papua in Indonesia is believed to be home to more than 40 indigenous groups that have never been contacted. The eastern part of the island, Papua New Guinea, is also home to hundreds of tribes, but unlike the Indonesian West, these tribes live more or less in open contact with civilization. In the Congo Basin, in the heart of Africa, home to the world's second largest rainforest after the Amazon, live the Boka a group that is suffering land theft and murder by the Barry Park Rangers who in reality should be protecting their rights. Even more isolated are those people who live on the atolls. At one time, Australia, or rather Oceania as a continent, was that area of the world that boasted the largest number of indigenous people ever to come into contact with modernity. The Australian Aborigines met British colonization in the late 18th century, and since then the last virgin tribe to come out of the enclosure of peoples never contacted was the Pintupi Nine, Aborigines in the Northern Territory. In 1984 the Pintupi were officially the last tribe on the Oceanic continent to come out of complete isolation. At present, at least based on what we know, the only island group that avoids any contact with the rest of the world is the well-known Sentinelese. North Sentinel Island is located in the Andaman Archipelago, which is under the jurisdiction of the Indian government. But a clarification must be made. In the Andamans, the Sentinelese are not the only isolated indigenous group. There's also the Yarawas, who reside on the western coast of the Andamans and have been decimated by the constant safaris organized by private tourist companies. North Sentinel, on the other hand, is a peculiar case in its own right. They hate safaris and do not allow themselves to be approached. Suffice it to say for now that India has established a 3 km per meter around the island to prevent ships, fishing boats and unwary tourists from approaching. There have been very few encounters between foreigners and locals, all on the beach and never in sight, 
with shipwrecked fishermen and murdered adventurers. According to a study in the American Journal of Human Genetics, the Sentinelese are said to be related to other indigenous groups in the Andaman Islands and share the same Asian ancestry with them. However, nothing is known about their language, and Indian authorities have only rough estimates of the number of inhabitants, perhaps around 200. At the time of the tsunami that hit Southeast Asia in 2004, the Indian government sent a helicopter to check on the tribe's situation. The helicopter was greeted with a bow and arrow and a clear message. You are not welcome here. We don't want you. But as mentioned, the Sentinelese are more unique than rare, because today most of the tribes ever contacted live in South America, deep in the Amazon rainforests. Brazil, which with its vast territory contains almost all of these peoples, boasts a range of 77 to 84 tribes, a data impossible to verify. The number of indigenous people currently living in Brazil who have never come into contact with technologically advanced men would range from a minimum of 600 to a maximum of about 1000. Many of these live in the western states of Mato Grosso, Rondonia and Acre. Further south, however, in the Peruvian forest, it's not uncommon to encounter this warning sign. Do not try to contact indigenous people, do not give them clothes or food, do not photograph them, because they might see the camera as a weapon. In both Peru and Brazil, illegal logging poses a huge risk to indigenous people, a risk that not only takes away vital portions of land from indigenous people, but also seriously endangers the lives of the inhabitants themselves. The Brazilian government has repeatedly organized first contact expeditions to track down the tribes, following the maxim of thought that knowing where they are is the best way to protect them. FUNAI, the Brazilian government agency that deals with indigenous issues, has as its main purpose to protect the tribes in the Amazon basin with frequent flyovers to check their movements or to keep them away from illegal invasions by Brazilian loggers. It can sometimes happen in Brazil that the contacts are the result of the will of the indigenous people themselves. Presence of isolated Indios generates panic at the border, headlined this Brazilian newspaper. The fact that indigenous people make contact with foreigners would not be dictated by a desire to trade, but by fear. In fact, through people who spoke a language similar to their own, the language of the Panoan group, in 2014, a group of indigenous people from the state of Acre, the Yawanawa, claimed to have been subjected to violent attacks by loggers and cocaine traffickers. Moreover, according to Survival International, the Yawanawa, literally the people of the wild boar, didn't stumble upon the quote-unquote foreign Brazilians by accident. Actually, these tribes always know exactly where to go. They know the territory perfectly, and most likely know the outside world much better than ordinary people think. This aspect goes against the typical cliché. Namely, the fact that peoples like the Yawanawa live unknowingly in a bubble of wilderness, not realizing that their little corner of the world is actually part of a much larger whole, dominated by other human beings. The mistake we civilized people make is to see the world like a video game, like Civilization for example, where everything starts with a thatched hut and the rest of the map is just fog of war. However, history can teach us something. Over the centuries and even decades past, local tribes have been enslaved by foreigners, European or otherwise. Since the arrival of whites in the Americas, indigenous peoples have learned to fear men with technological tools and have passed this message of warning from generation to generation through oral accounts. In the 60s and 70s, Brazil then saw the Amazon as an abandoned place in need of development, and indigenous people who opposed this progress were given little or no warning before their homes were bulldozed to the ground by multinationals or by the government itself. Consider the massacres carried out up to and throughout the 70s by natural rubber scavengers against the Sinta Larga tribe in Mato Grosso and Rondonia. From their helicopters, the scavengers dropped sticks of dynamite on the villages to drive out the natives, with all the consequences we can imagine. Also, in the Brazilian state of Rondonia, one single man, often referred to as the last of his tribe, still lives in a buffer zone, a patch of forest bordered voluntarily by the government his people were killed by ranchers many years ago. 
When the government managed to get on the man's trail in 1996, the exploration team was met with a bow and arrow, as always. And just like in his case, another tribe reduced to the bone is the Akunsu. The Akunsu live in a territory demarcated by the Brazilian government in the state of Rondonia. The Brazilian government had the fabulous idea of building an highway around their plot, BR-364. The region was thus occupied by timber companies, landowners and cattle ranchers. In 1995, Funai discovered that the ranchers themselves had taken over the Akunsu's lands, slaughtering almost all of their members and raising homes to hide the murder. To date, only five Akunsu are still alive. Not that the situation is any rosier in other South American nations. In 2007, Peru's then-president, Alan Garcia, became a denialist promoter, claiming that the Masco Piro were nothing more than a fiction created by environmentalists to oppose oil exploration in the area. Unfortunately, Peru has always been courted by multinational oil companies, and today more than 70% of Peru's Amazon territory is divided into various oil concessions, many of which were part of those parcels controlled by indigenous people. They call it land grabbing. But land grabbing is a vast phenomenon, which does not only affect South American territories and would need specific investigation. Even today we Westerners are guilty of land grabbing all over the world. In the early 80s, Shell's exploration in Peru led to contact with the Nahua reserve. Within a few years, 50% of the Nahua would die, some from violence, some from disease. The other major threat to Peruvian peoples are illegal loggers, many of whom go after mahogany. Known as red gold, mahogany possesses a much higher price on the global market than any other types of wood. And so the question became, why don't we take a little trip to the indigenous forests rich in this material? In the late 90s, the situation evolved to such an extent that it caused a real red gold fever. Driven by a desire to get rich, loggers forced contact with the Murunawa tribe, causing a similar misfortune to what happened to the Yanomami in northern Brazil, on the border with Venezuela. With the difference that the course of the Yanomami was gold, the real gold, the gold sought by the Garimpeiros. For thousands of Muranawa, the rush for red gold was disastrous. Half the population was decimated by colds, flu and respiratory infections, with many thanks from the logging companies. The Peruvian government has always denied the existence of tribes like the Muranawa, yet satellite photos, footage and interviews belied the denialism of government officials. Many of these peoples are thus faced with a difficult choice. Avoid contact at all costs or risk death from disease and violence. Diseases, precisely because of the low immune defenses that indigenous people have not developed over the centuries, are the main cause of death. Simply put, we are now witnessing what happened at the time of the great explorations in the 16th century to the Indios of the New World. Or perhaps we can say that the slaughter of Latin America never ended. A sadly exemplary case occurred in 1987, when a group of missionaries, the New Tribes Mission, made contact with the Zoe tribe in Brazil. Before they met the white men, the Zoe had no diseases. Within a year of first contact with them, half of the Zoe population had died of disease. Also, the new tribe's mission in Paraguay organized a kind of manhunt against the Ayureo Todobegozode tribe, the only virgin tribe in South America living outside the Amazon basin. In essence, they were forcibly taking indigenous people and removing them from where they belonged so that they could start large-scale deforestation works and set up farming and ranching camps. This video by Survival International is worth a thousand words. To counter these abuses, Convention 169 on Indigenous and Tribal Peoples was drafted in 1989 by the UN. Ratified by 23 nations, the Convention aims to protect fundamental rights for the survival of Indigenous people, including their right to land tenure and self-determination, and to date, this is the only instrument that protects these tribes on paper from discrimination and violence. But as is often the case, a single convention cannot suffice, and governments that even sign it end up ignoring its content. 
Now, without necessarily lapsing into the myth of the good savage, these hunter-gatherers are a remnant of our past, a millennial past. South American tribes, unlike the Sentinelese, do not live on an island sheltered from modern society. Today, in every nook and cranny of the world's largest forest, and eventually, we too will witness the extinction of the last tribe ever contacted. See you when I recover.